Hello, thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm Simon Thomas from the Blender Studio, and I'm going to talk a little bit about procedural oil painting for film production um, with Blender and Geometry Notes. So, most people probably already recognize this uh, this fish here. If uh, you don't recognize it, you should probably update your Blender because this is the <laughs> the splash screen for Blender 4.2. And uh, Maybe you saw the screening yesterday of the gold showcase that we produced with the Blender Studio that this uh, splash screen came out of. Uh, it was screening two times yesterday after the animation festival. If you didn't see it yet, then you get a little bit more of an insight now. But uh, otherwise, I'll talk about how we achieved this look that you saw. So I don't have to introduce Blender to anybody here, I assume. But let me talk a little bit about the Blender Studio because maybe there's some people that don't know what we do. Um, blend, uh, the Blender Studio has basically been a key factor of Blender's success by doing something that's called content-driven development. And that's something very common for large studios in Hollywood or so, uh, developing in-house software and technology, but less common for the world of commercial, off-the-shelf software, especially with open source. And uh, Blender is pursuing this model with the Blender Studio, we have a team of uh, artists, technical artists, working in close co collaboration with the developers of Blender here uh, at the headquarters in Amsterdam on the software of Blender at the same time as creating projects uh, with Blender, with the experimental version, testing it every day and uh, developing new features for it. And we've been doing that for a while. Me personally, I only start with like the last row of these films here, but we've been doing it for almost 20 years in total. And the goal is generally to create a lot of uh, creative diversity with these different projects and pursue different creative challenges so we can also push Blender in all sorts of different directions. And uh, this is definitely not the most efficient way of uh, doing this kind of content creation, but for the software development of Blender, it's something very, very valuable and something very uh, unique. And um, there's a lot of uh, knowledge about production with Blender that comes out of this and uh, technology that we develop at the Blender Studio. And the idea is that we share all of that with the uh, Blender community, with people that are using Blender in uh, productions to learn from our struggles and see the whole process. So that's also something very important to our, uh, to our mission to share all of that. And uh, yeah, there's a relatively small independent team uh, you can find out more on the website, uh, studio.blender.org. We have a subscription service to share all of the stuff that we're doing. And um, in my case, personally, I work also very closely with the development team for uh, Geometry Notes, specifically in Blender, uh, designing and reviewing new features. And uh, yeah, so that was just the small section to give a bit more context about what we do, who we are. And now let's get more into the nitty gritty uh, oil painting stuff. So Project Gold, the, uh, the general idea with this was that when it comes to, uh, to rendering in mainstream 3D animations, it's kind of been done, the whole like realism, uh, the whole realism idea of uh, creating hyper-realistic animations. It's kind of a completed quest by this point. And you see a lot more also in uh, current new outcoming uh, projects, something like uh, Spider-Verse, Arcane, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles, Wild Robot, that there's more of a, a drive towards something more gritty, organic in terms of rendering styles. And that's something we wanted to pursue as well and see how can we do this kind of thing in Blender and create a more uh, like unique look in a way that is very specific to what we want to uh, show with this project. And um, inspired by that, so since 2023, we started this project, Project Gold, and it was generally aimed at tackling this, this, this quest of something more stylized and creating a painterly look. But a painterly look is a bit easier said than done. It can mean a lot of different things. And even just talking about the art style, the amount of directions that you go into are endless, basically. And even within like saying, okay, we want to do something oil painterly, that can mean endless different things. Like if you study different uh, artists that have been doing oil paintings, throughout the centuries, there's so many different techniques that you can learn from and directions that you can go into. So even within the realm of oil painting, there's already endless uh, options. And uh, here's some of the concept art that, we, uh, that was created for the project, most of it by 
Florent Mazarel, Florent Mazarel and uh, Vivian Lodokowski. And uh, we were just trying out different things, looking at different styles uh, and studying really what kind of makes up the style that we're looking for. And um, at the same time as just exploring the visual look of the style, we also, of, uh, of course, need to tackle the technical challenges. So where in the shading and rendering pipeline do we actually define this style? Because we need to implement it at the end of the day. So besides just studying the look, we need to also study how can we uh, achieve this. And, um, and how do the artists actually interact with the assets and the environment to pull this off? So um, we had to ask ourselves a bunch of different questions looking at these images. How can we expose a fine grain control over the look while still keeping a high level of uh, throughput so we don't have to spend ages on a single asset, but we can actually uh, go for a production like this. And um, what is feasible also with the limited amount of people, because that's also something that's an ingrained part of the mission of the Bender Studio is allowing small teams to do great things like this. And um, other questions like how do we create dynamic effects in an oil painterly style in a way that it's reproducible so we don't have to hand paint everything and it's also consistent with the rest of the animation so it doesn't stick out it's like a completely stuck on thing uh, other questions like how do we break up gradients lighting effects in a way that it looks painted without actually being painted or partially painted and, and uh, yeah, some all sorts of different mixes of how we achieve this and uh, I don't know if it was obvious, uh, but the last two slides were actually renderings from the film. Um, I assume that probably most people here saw it yesterday, so it was probably not so much of a surprise. But <laughs> um, if you didn't catch it, that means we did a good job. And um, I'll show more in, uh, in a bit. But for now, let's talk a bit about the strategy in terms of like the big picture for Blender development of uh, the direction that we chose to pursue this kind of uh, new technology development. And um, generally for Blender development, that meant you want to uh, empower the artists, like the technical artists, to develop their own tools rather than focusing too much on new core development. Because something very important for these kinds of productions is to uh, be flexible with the tools that you're creating and make something that's unique to a specific style because it, it's, it's such a specific thing. We don't want to pre-build something into Blender that then solves this one problem perfectly and you can make great stuff that has a very specific look. But the idea is more that we want to empower the people to create their own tools uh, that they can integrate into their production pipelines in a way that is convenient to use um, and uh, does just the job that they needed to do perfectly. And uh, for that, we are focusing mainly also on uh, geometry nodes because that's a tool that allows us to do these kinds of things and uh, yeah, empower technical uh, artists to develop their own uh, pipelines like that. And the development of geometry nodes in general is kind of blurring the line between content production and tool development. So that's kind of the idea to focus more on this kind of uh, development for Blender as a big picture uh, target. And um, yeah, the brushstroke stuff that we've been doing for that is also like generally a pretty useful proof of concept for this direction of development that has been working quite well in the past uh, few years for Blender. Uh, yeah, and the idea is to use geometry nodes, like a geometry nodes driven system, driven by fully integrated Blender tools that already exist and uh, some custom ones that you can tack on uh, additionally. But it's all one uh, integrated ecosystem, basically, that the technical artists can author as well. But to make that possible, obviously, there's still a bunch of uh, low-level engineering on the Blender side to be done. So it's not just the Blender Studio with their own tools. Of course, it's a, it's a back and forth. There's a lot of um, groundwork that needs to be done on the development side. So that's uh, something great that comes out of that for Blender development. But let's look a little bit more on uh, how the final product is used. And uh, the idea is that we have the asset creation process that uh, mainly defines the, the look. And uh, for that, we 
want the artist to just interact with tools that uh, they have in the toolbar. It should be very simple and um, intuitive to understand for the user that's actually using the tools. And everything is driven uh, behind the scenes by a geometry nodes system, like a node tree. But the idea is that the artists don't actually need to interact with that node tree, but they drive the parameters just with the modifier stack. So far, that's how it works. That's, that's uh, already established. And um, yeah, they can just use the familiar UI that they already know to drive custom tools driven by geometry nodes under the hood. And um, additionally, also the integrated tools for like uh, modeling, uh, curve editing, stuff like that that already exists in Blender to just drive the input of the procedural system uh, together with the uh, customizable options in the uh, modifier settings. And then now, additionally, we also uh, spent some time on doing some Python development on top of that to bring more and more of that user interface also into the 3D viewport itself. So we have we can, we can spend most of the amount of time from uh, working on the asset just directly in the 3D viewport itself. So there's just a tool on the side that you can use to drive uh, the input and then all of the parameters for the, for the look you actually have just on the sidebar and you can manage the different layers of painting the brush strokes. I know it's still pretty abstract when I talk about this because I didn't actually talk in detail about how it actually works, but I'm going to go over that in a bit. Um, right, so for me as a technical artist setting this up, there's a bunch of goals that we set ourselves in the beginning to, uh, to hit that we wanted the tools to uh, provide for us to actually pull this off. And uh, first of all, we definitely want to be highly flexible and have uh, art directability baked into the system so we can actually control the look as, as well as possible on different levels. And uh, yeah, obviously it should look nice and uh, authentic to what we're trying to achieve with the oil painting look. And also give us like a fresh and unique impression that we haven't really seen because that's kind of always what we're trying to do. Like it's a little bit reinventing the wheel maybe, but uh, it always brings us to come to uh, very interesting insights um, and uh, yeah, just make something unique. And uh, also it should be possible to, with a relatively small team, achieve uh, things that might look like uh, that have been more people working on it. So I have a high throughput. So it was actually the magic stuff that goes into that. I kind of already mentioned it a bunch of times because I forgot to avoid mentioning it, but it's based on brush strokes. So that's kind of the, uh, the key part of the painterly look that we developed for uh, this project. And uh, yeah, for that we built a brush stroke system that's kind of procedural in some ways. In other ways, uh, you also have a lot of manual control. So we have like one main system that's driving everything, but uh, you can hook up to it on different levels to make it like a fully procedural thing where you don't have to touch anything. You just tweak some parameters and that's it. Or we have uh, ver uh, ways of using it where you have a lot more manual input. And um, uh, yes, so now for the people, I mean, most people I think have seen it already yesterday, but I'm going to show like a, an excerpt of the final thing of the uh, project. So we can just watch that so everybody has an idea of what it looks like. Yep, that's it. And I'm realizing I'm already about to hit the 20-minute mark. I think this is going to go quite over time, but there's nothing after here, so feel free to leave. Uh, but uh, I'm going to just keep talking. Um, 
so brushstrokes. Brushstrokes. <laughs> yeah, so that's what it looks like in the viewport. It's a big mess of just uh, three-dimensional mesh brushstrokes on absolutely everything. And um, yeah, everything that you looked at in the film basically looked like this in the viewport. It's just lots of 3D geometry brushstrokes everywhere. And um, I go over what exactly that means in a bit. And uh, yeah, usually we work with the brushstrokes turned off because it's not very efficient to have everything on at the same time. Usually you wouldn't need to see it like this because it doesn't really add much unless you actually want to see the final result with uh, rendering turned on. And uh, now I want to go a little bit about uh, over some of the features of oil painting that this kind of this approach kind of brings us from uh, how it works just naturally, which is uh, first of all a natural blending of the colors. So inside of the rendering pipeline of uh, rendering these mesh brush strokes, it kind of inherently brings us this kind of natural blending of colors as we render everything with a certain uh, transparency level. So the different brush strokes that are overlaying each other are all kind of rendered together and blend overall. So each brush strokes kind of have its, has its own unique color that doesn't really change throughout the brush stroke too much, but um, it comes together as a blended image. Oh yeah, uh, another thing to mention is that that's not really something you can achieve with some other methods like baking in the normals in a, a painterly way because it's next to each other, but not actually overlaying. Uh, another thing is fuzzy outlines, so you can actually break up the outlines of the objects because it's all 3D geometry that's tacked onto the smooth surfaces of the assets. Uh, it's another thing you could achieve also with like compositing, but that brings some other challenges, so that's kind of something that we get for free. Uh, we also have like a high level of detail on kind of the, the meta level because we're not like not on the detail of the asset itself, but on the detail of how the asset cre is created with the brush strokes. So if you like, really zoom in, you see, oh, these are actually like fine uh, brush strokes that kind of look somewhat realistic and have also the lighting of the scenes on them. So you can kind of see this uh, impasto effect of like a thick brush stroke that is actually uh, lit up by the environment and maybe cast a shadow. Like we have control over that as well. And um, so the fact that everything is uh, in 3D means that we have also uh, PBR rendering um, shading model on these brush strokes so they're not just like a color and then that's what you get like when you do 2D painting but it's painted with some meta information like for example the color of the brush strokes but also rendered with the same kind of PBR uh, material that we would use on the asset itself and that way it catches dynamic lighting effects like also reflections and everything just naturally and you can yeah, it just kind of works from every lighting scenario. Uh, and then on that brushstroke level, it also gives us a lot of visual flexibility of defining exactly how we want things to look. So even without changing anything about the textures of the asset itself, we can uh, control a lot about like the, the, the look of the overall style of the characters and the environments, but also the look of certain materials just by how we distribute the brush strokes and how we give them different colors or different textures or uh, we saw earlier also there were some brush strokes that had like this canvas texture on top of them to kind of communicate a fabric material. Uh, there's all sorts of different opportunities of like meta information that you can stack into these brush strokes that are not just the textures of the asset itself. Um, yes, and then just because of how the system works and how it's integrated with geometry nodes, we get a lot of opportunities of coming up with creative solutions for technical problems, like for effects. So we had this uh, light body of the character here, for example, where uh, we could just use the same system that we have already for the brush strokes and just instead of putting them on top of a surface, actually putting them into the volume of the character and creating this kind of uh, yeah, light shape, uh, which is kind of a unique uh, thing. And it didn't really take that long to get to this result because we already had the system in place. We just need to drive it with a different input. Uh, and that in that same node that also allows us to have a lot of dynamic effects. Like if you look on the water here, for example, there's this uh, spray from the, uh, from the, uh, on the water from the wind that is just uh, shooting out of the, the waves as they're building the crests. Uh, and that's also just like integrated with the brushstroke system. So that 
allows us to have a very coherent style for everything that we do because we're using the same brushstroke system just based on different inputs. We can uh, like to go, to go over what is here in this image, for example, the trees in the background, are assets that are actually hand painted with the, with the system and then instantiated all over the place. Uh, same for the clouds, for example. And then we have the character and uh, background assets that use uh, a method of procedurally placing the brush strokes around with a certain control by the artist. Uh, and then we have completely customized uh, simulation setup, uh, for example, for the waves crashing into the rocks and building this, this foam. So there's all sorts of different levels of interactability for the artist or like a procedural approach to create the input for the system, but it's all the same system in the end. So it comes together in a coherent style. Uh, right now, I already mentioned, oh, they replaced already mentioned a little bit, uh, we had some just manually drawn things. We also had some manually drawn effects that were frame by frame drawn, but because it's using the same brush strokes and everything, it blends together pretty well. So the wave that's crashing against the bolt here, for example. We didn't do that that much, though, because we did that like in the end, where we had like some extra time for some people that were doing this. Um, but yeah. And then overall important for an animation, uh, with lots of deformating, uh, deforming characters and stuff like that is temporal stability. We don't want things to just randomly flicker around. If something flickers, we want to have control over that because it might be an artistic choice. So uh, we started out like building the system in a way that it's just temporally stable, whatever we do. Uh, there was also some development for Blender geometry nodes going on to make that possible, uh, but we pulled that off and then we made everything unstable again, but this time by choice, by uh, making them flicker a little bit around, so have uh, to, to emulate kind of this like frame by frame oil painted look without making it too too much that, but more of like a, its own thing. So we're kind of replacing the textures of the brush strokes individually rather than like repainting the whole thing. All right, so now we have an overview of a bunch of the different features of this. So let's go a little bit more about uh, over the theory and the technicalities of how this works. And for that, I just split that out into some different topics. So fundamentally, uh, those of you that don't know, geometry nodes is just a, a procedural node system that can handle all sorts of different types of geometry in the 3D viewport um, to do procedural processing on. Uh, and the main components for this that we need here are just curves and meshes. And the thing to remember here is that the output is just going to be a mesh. Everything is a mesh in the end, and the input is always just a curve. And how you get to that curve doesn't actually matter. You can generate it also with procedu uh, procedurally with geometry nodes. You can draw it yourself. You can import it from somewhere else. Uh, and then we have the node system that uh, connects those two and actually turns the curves into brush strokes using some meta information that you can bake into the curves. All right, that's like the fundamentals. And then uh, about the brush strokes themselves. Like I said, everything is rendered as a brush stroke in the end, but how is that actually made up? It's a mesh like this that has the brush stroke mapped on it using a shader. To, to render the whole thing out with PBR and the lighting. And it uses a bunch of the information that it gets from the procedural uh, system, like the UVs, for example, to map that uh, brush stroke on it. We have some additional, uh, additional information that we're using in the shader that I'll go over in a bit. Um, and yeah, that all comes from a curve that is then meshed into a mesh strip and has the brush stroke mapped on it. And that curve can be controlled by an artist or can be placed on points that are scattered on the object, and then you have different ways of controlling that. I'll go over that in a bit as well. Right now, actually. So, <laughs> so there's a, uh, a, as an alternative to the, uh, the manual distribution, you can go a step further and just take a, any surface, surface mesh from an asset, like a character that is deforming. Uh, and then we just scatter a bunch of points on those uh, surfaces, and from those, we generate the brush strokes procedurally with another system where the main way of controlling that is a flow map that we can draw in the 3D viewport on top of the asset to kind of define and guide the brush strokes. And the way that works is that on each of those points, we just have an individual curve that kind of expands step by step. It like looks through the, the flow map uh, and expands along it to build up this final 
overall brushstroke flow, which can then be manipulated also with all sorts of inputs because we, we, have, we have access to any point of that setup because it's just a node system. So we can drive and manipulate how that is generated in all sorts of ways. Okay, and then how do we actually uh, make up the, the look of the brush strokes? Start with curves into meshes, and to those meshes with the shader, we map uh, a random, basically random uh, brush stroke that is usually scanned from an atlas like this. So uh, Vivian was drawing a whole bunch of different brush strokes and we had like a library of different styles. If you wanted to have something a little bit more like a dry brush that's a bit more, uh, a bit more grainy um, or something more thick, we had different options that we could select from for the material uh, to map onto the mesh. And the way that worked was that based on the length of the curve, the shader would just select a specific length of brush stroke that we provided in the atlas so it doesn't look like completely squashed or anything. And uh, right, so one of these axes is like different length, uh, lengths, and then on the other axis is just random. Oh, sorry. So it just mapped the correct one in a random place. And uh, to get all that working, we used the ability of uh, Blender to have interactivity between the different node systems, the geometry nodes and the shader system, where the output of the data that we're using to actually render everything, which is the meshes, can have all sorts of information as attributes stacked onto it, which we can just process in the shader um, to achieve these kinds of effects. So uh, yeah, it, all, it goes one way around. There's no like, communication to feed back into the geometry system with the shader nodes, but we don't actually need that. It's just about feeding information that can be processed from geometry nodes into the shader nodes for all sorts of things, like the color of the brush strokes, which can be set on the geometry level already, uh, the UV maps to map them, the UV map also from the original asset, so we can use the texture of the asset to give the color to the brush strokes, and we don't even have to manually put that in as well normal, opacity, length, position, all sorts of stuff that we can just feed into the shader to actually render everything in this way. Let's talk about the tools. And for that, we're going to go back to our friend, the fish. Um, so how did it actually look like when you were working on this? And uh, my first example here is just going over the final asset. You can see it deforming with the brush strokes and everything, and then toggling on and off some of these layers, because it's not just like one brush stroke layer. You can just layer them many times as you want. I mean, it's going to be, get more expensive to render eventually, but um, you can achieve so, uh, all sorts of uh, specific styles like this and uh, have different layers that just give a different purpose for the way they want to layer the material. Um, oh yeah, but on, underneath that we have the, the base mesh that has just a simple texture, just a color gradient, and then everything is broken up on top of that anyways with the brush strokes. So the texture painting part of this was actually very, very quick to do because it's just giving the base color. But then the asset creation is actually more about placing, guiding, and uh, manipulating the brush strokes. That's, that's kind of the shading process in the end. And then one of the ways of manipulating this is the, the flow. So you can just in real time just, just draw in the flow and then the system adapts and just cleverly figures out to uh, interpolate to different curves that you're drawing in, and then you have a bunch of different parameters for the geometry node system to get more dense brush strokes, have them longer, thicker, uh, give them some random variations. There's all sorts of different controls that the artist can then, in the asset creation process, manipulate to get a specific look for uh, either the style in general or the material. And then another way to control the flow was also to just set it in the asset geometry itself. So for some assets, it wasn't really necessary to have a fine grain control over the exact flow. And it would be enough to just use the flow of the topology itself to mark some of the edges as, okay, I want this to define the flow. And for that, we just had a, a geometry nodes node tool to just set an attribute that can be picked up for the geometry node system then. So that made it a lot easier to just define the flow without having to create an additional geometry to, to draw. It uh, can obviously also be driven by uh, image textures, so we can have an image texture to define both the density and the color of the brush strokes. So here, for example, for the kind of uh, colorful dotted uh, scales on the fish, we just had an image texture where 
uh, I could just uh, use the alpha for the density and then the color for the color of the brush strokes to make it a lot easier to just very precisely control the distribution of still procedurally generated brush strokes. So I don't have to actually draw every single scale, but I have control over it if I need to, so I can just erase some of the pixels and it just goes away. Uh, and then uh, another way of inputting is literally just manual. So for that here, I'm actually using Grease Pencil 3, which it's not Grease Pencil 3, is it Grease Pencil 3? It says 4.2, oh, I think I was still in experimental. <laughs> this is Grease Pencil 3, um, working together with the Geometry Node system uh, to have manual input where you can select the color and then with the strength of the brush, like it actually uses your pen pressure and everything to uh, do the same kind of drawing you use from, to from drawing applications to have precise manual input for the brush strokes. And then that was a couple months ago. Now we actually have the add-on, which uh, hopefully we're gonna release soon uh, as a free extension on the extensions platform. But uh, the idea is that then you have just the 3D viewport rather than having the properties panel open all the time to do all of your brushstroke uh, needs right there, to select different styles, have different controls over how it looks, and everything is right there. So here's a little uh, snippet of how that works. But we're gonna, we're gonna uh, talk more about that in the future. The future. So, <laughs> as I just mentioned, uh, for the, uh, the add-on, the idea is to release it for free on the extension platform. I've been working on that for the past like two months or so to actually package what we developed for the production of the Project Gold uh, in a way that people can just use it, which is great because we didn't have this add-on when we were actually making the project. It was a bit more finicky, but now it should be a lot easier to use. You don't actually need the insights uh, of a technical artist working on the thing to actually use it, which is the whole idea with this project. And um, uh, eventually, of course, we want to make more and more use of the improved tools that are integrated into Blender directly uh, to uh, drive the, the inputs because there's still a bunch of things that we would like to have that are not in Blender right now to make this process easier. And uh, obviously also like the Geometry Nodes project is moving more and more, like I mentioned in the beginning, also into the direction of customizable tools that's still in its early stages, so the more and more development happens for that, the more we can actually make custom brushes that do all sorts of things just from the toolbar, which right now is relatively limited. And for that kind of uh, stuff, the add-on was also an amazing proof of concept to just see how do we want this even to look potentially in the future for Blender development? How do we want to have people interact with procedural tools? Um, and how can we expose most of that usability in a way that it makes sense and is intuitive and uh, uh, yeah, technical artists are able to author these tools in a way that makes sense. And about the files, so the Blender 4.2 splash screen obviously is already downloadable, so you can just get the file, look at the brush strokes there in 3D. It uh, should render on your machine, I hope. Um, and then for the Project Gold, we have the production logs, uh, files, video logs, and everything. Uh, and more content to come, as I mentioned, because we're not fully wrapped up yet. You saw the pre-premiere yesterday, but it's not actually premiered yet. Uh, on our website, on studio.blender.org, I would recommend you to check that out. And uh, yeah, the add-on is going to be on the extensions platform and extensions.blender.org with some documentation. And uh, there's going to be more content on the studio website. So if you actually want to have the full uh, insight on how to use the different features of the tool, it would be best to sign up to that mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but the tool itself will just be free. And here at the Beacon yesterday, you, if you haven't seen it, you missed it. The pre-premiere of the actual whole showcase is going to be online in a couple of weeks, something like that. Uh, besides that, we're going to be at the market tomorrow from 10 to 16. So for a bunch of hours, we can check out the, the add-on in action and just chat with the people from the Blender Studio about different things. But we have a booth in the, in the market where we're going to demo stuff. So drop by there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.